Mic check. There you go. Praise God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time together. Thank you for the word of God. Lord, just invite the Holy Spirit. We know he's already here, but Lord, I just pray by your Holy Spirit that you would help us, Lord, to understand, that you would help us to know you better. Thank you, Lord, for your grace being revealed to us, Lord. Thank you for your, the word. Thank you for your power being made manifest in us, Lord. And so, Lord, I just pray that you'd anoint me right now, Lord, to speak as you would have me speak, to share what you would have me share, Lord, that you would be glorified. And so thank you, Lord, for the word tonight. Bless your people, refresh their hearts. Thank you that for your grace being to them right now as they receive the word of God so that it can be with them as they go. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Praise God. Well, we are in Colossians. We're going over the book of Colossians. Um, so we've been uh, settled down for a couple of weeks now uh, discussing hope. Um, but we're going to transition now to uh, another part, another aspect of what we're going over here in Colossians. So, so let's dive into Colossians 1, uh, 1 through 8. And it says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Of this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel which has come to you, as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing. So it also does among you since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the spirit. So we had been focusing on verse five, because verse 4 says, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all the saints. And then we saw that the foundation of that was because of the hope. So we wanted to dive into that and talk about that hope and to see how that is a foundation for the fact that we have the faith and this love, you know, for each other, for one another. And so we went a few weeks into discussing the hope, all those things that we have to look forward to. And all of those things that they, 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 uh, they settle us and they help us persevere because no, we know this is not my home, right? I've got something in store. I've got this big surprise. He's giving me a little bit of insight, the Lord, in the word. But there's so much more. Praise God. A heavenly body, the glory of God uh, to dwell with Christ forever. Uh, the heavenly city that's coming down. It's going to come down and just and we're going to be the bride of Christ. And there we are in, in a procession, right? Just like a beautiful bride would come down the aisles. Like there we go. And all this we have to look forward to. No more sin to struggle with. No more pain. No more suffering. No more doctor's visits. Praise God. Right? No more medicines. You know? Uh, I mean, just all the effects of sin, right? It's just... Psh, we have to, that to look forward to. Praise God. And most of all, we get to enjoy God forever. I mean, that's why Paul even said in Philippians, is to live as Christ, to die as gain. I mean, what a statement. In other words, he knew the hope. Man, this isn't, this isn't my home. It's like, I, want, I'll, I have Christ now. Let me live. I live. But if I die, I'm going to gain more of Christ. And in, in, in the hope that we have is like, we're, yes, that's what we're going to have. We're going to have more of Christ, right? So we were diving into that and the hope that we have. And it, that, that develops our faith and that, and that fosters the love. And we'll get into that actually later uh, in the coming weeks. But now I want you to focus on, it says in, in verse 5, he says, Because of the hope laid out for you in heaven, of this you've heard it before in the word of the truth, the gospel. Okay. And then, he, and then jumped down to, well, in verse 6, towards the end, he says, Since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth. So tonight we're going to talk about the gospel, the grace of God in truth that's been presented to all of us, right? Whether it was a gospel tract. I remember one of our former pastors, Chester Gross, he, that's how he got saved. So the Holy Spirit used a tract that was on the road, picked it up, he read it, the plan of salvation, God's plan of salvation, and just came to repentance. God just 
touched them there on the street, right? Like, hey, I mean, for me, it wasn't even a gospel presentation. It was just being sanctified, being set apart. My, my mom's like wrangling me into to church, right? You're going to hear the word and hearing the word, and you're going to be here and, and just listen. The, the, just the worship service, the Holy Spirit just said, okay, psh, here you go. And I just came to faith, right? <laughs> just minding my own business, bored out of my mind. Like, why are people singing? This is boring. And I could be at home watching cartoons or whatever, right? And just like, God captured my soul, right? That's, that's the Lord. But, but traditionally, most of the time, somebody presents the gospel to us, right? So we're going to talk about the gospel the, uh, in the Greek, the euangelion. Love that word. Just kind of, well, that sounds kind of cool, right? Euangelion rolls off the tongue. It just means good message, the good news, the proclamation of the grace of God manifest and pledged in Christ Jesus. So, before we go on with that, let's review really quick why Paul wrote this letter, or his letter to the Colossians. What was the primary issue or concern? Because there was a reason he wrote it. Remember, he, he hadn't ministered to the, the Colossians, right? It was Epaphras. He, this is the people that, you know, he brought in, he evangelized, but he was with Paul, you know, whether he was visiting him in jail, we don't know, or maybe he's in jail with them, we don't know, but there he is, because Paul's writing this from jail. And so there was an issue, right, that, that needed to be addressed. So in Colossians 2, one through four, he says, For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you, and for those at Laodicea, and for all who have not seen me face to face. So there it again. In other words, I haven't even seen you face. I've never seen you before, right? All right. And it says that their hearts may be encouraged. Okay. Now, let me go back, because did you notice that? He says, For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you. Paul's struggling in, in, in prayer and desire uh, that they would continue in the faith. He, in here in verse 2, he says that their hearts may be encouraged. I want you to be encouraged, right? Be knit together in love to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. See, there's the struggle. He understands. Epaphras has told him, there are people that are teaching some things that are anti-Christ. In other words, then, okay, yeah, Jesus is okay, but he's not it, right? There's more. There's this knowledge. There's this other stuff you've got to do and all this. And so Paul is saying, no, right? I want you to come to this full of assurance of understanding and knowledge. That's why if you look at chapter 1 towards the end of it, he's just talking about the preeminence of Christ, He's the creator. He's the all in all. It's all about him and through him and to him and just like lifting up Christ. You know, like he's there. He's not, he's not just like this. He's not an angel or something. He's, he's God, right? And then talking about his, uh, what he did there on the cross. And then Colossians 2.20. It says, if with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why as if you were still alive in the world do you submit to its regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. Referring to things that all perish as they are used according to human precepts and teachings. In other words, they're not biblical, right? People come up with these things. He says, these indeed, indeed have an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion. I want you to notice that phrase, self-made religion, right? That's the human teachings. It's not biblical. It's not in the word. Anytime somebody teaches you something and, and you're kind of like... Well, that kind of sounds right. But if you don't see it in the word, you need to run away from that. You need to deny that. That's not, that's not, that's anything that turns you away from Christ, right? And that's what he's talking about. He says, and notice he says, he says they're promoting self-made religion and asceticism, right? This strict way of living, right? The do not, do not do this, do not do that. And severity to the body, but they are of no value. Notice this. No value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. In other words, they have no power. Pastor I mentioned a little while the word transformation. The Holy Ghost transforms us, right? And we're going to look more in that a little bit. But anything else, any other teaching, there is no transformation. I mean, I've got, I know people that are Jehovah's Witnesses. I know people that, you know, other religions. And you don't see the power of God. Right? We don't see the power of God. And so in 2 Timothy 3, 5, he says, having the appearance of godliness. That's kind of what Paul was referring to here in, the, in, in Colossians, right? But denying its power. There's no power there. Right? 
He says, avoid such people. <laughs> In other words, people that want to teach you something else that is anti-Christ, right? Or that says, oh yeah, Christ is good, but. Always look out for the but, right? Now let's go on. So what are the elements, or so are some elements of this gospel of truth? So we wanted to get into, okay, why is Paul getting into this letter? Why is he writing what he's writing? Okay, and he always, and he, look at how it's, it's amazing, right? Because all he's doing, he's going back to the gospel. He's going back to the gospel. So we're going to look at John chapter 3. We're going to see a couple of elements of the gospel. And many of you are familiar with this, right? You know, know the situation where Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night? You know, he doesn't want the other Pharisees to know that I want to visit Jesus. And, and so there he is. The verse 1, now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night, right? Doesn't want to be seen, doesn't want anybody else to know. And said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher from God. For no one can do these, these signs that you do unless God is with him. Well, that's a good sign, right? That he recognizes, like, wow, man, these miracles I'm seeing, people just eyes open, the lame can walk. It's okay, this has to be a God thing. You must be from God. Verse 3, Jesus answered him. And I always thought this was peculiar, right? I mean, because he's acknowledging, yes, you're from God, but look at what Jesus tells him. Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Wow. So he just lays it out. In other words, you want to get to heaven, you've got to be born again. Now, as we go on to this, th think about that, okay? Because I've heard people say this, and, and uh, preachers have used this, and it's true. And we're going to see, you know, Jesus said, you know, you must be born again in verse 7. Right? You must be born again. You should have marveled. I say, you must be born again. You know, Billy Graham, that's one of the things he would say, you know? He goes, you must be born again. And I forget what other old-time preacher, I think it was from the 1800s, same thing, he would say, you must be born again. And somebody even asked him, why do you say that? Why do you say you must be born again? And he says, because you must be born again. <laughs> That's why I say it, because <laughs> it's the truth, right? You must be born again. Otherwise, you cannot see the kingdom of God. And then Paul, we're going to see later, kind of expounds on that, right? You can't see the kingdom of God. Now, think about that, because the kingdom of God is here now. Right? If you're, you belong to Christ, if the Holy Spirit resides you, remember, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You're part of the kingdom of God. Isn't that amazing? I mean, it's, it's, it's like if, if we could have like some kind of you know, vision by the Holy Spirit, some special, where you could spot like, ooh, I see the Holy Spirit there, there, there. Oh, not there. Oh, yes, here, here, here. You oh, and all of those, those are soldiers of Christ. They're all part of the family of God. They're in the kingdom of God, right? And so without being born again, we can't have access to the kingdom of God. Verse 4, Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Oh, interesting question. Like, well, what are you talking about, Jesus, right? Verse 5, Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So in other words, it has to be the Holy Spirit, right? He's already talking about the Holy Spirit, which they didn't even know about the Holy Spirit. He's talking about the Holy Spirit, and, and he says born of water, mean, referring to that washing that takes place, and we're going to see that later as well. And it has to be the, something that the Spirit does. All right? He says, uh, that which is born of flesh, verse 6, is flesh. Right? In other words, we're all born of flesh. Right? Came out of our mothers. Right? That's, that's the flesh thing. That's what happens. Which is a flesh. It's a natural thing. But yet even that, self, in, in, that in itself right, is very miraculous. Right? We marvel at like, wow, look at this little life. Right? You know, that's all, that, has, that in itself is a God thing. But yet... We have to also marvel at what God does when he births us into the kingdom, right? That's a miracle, right? And we're going to look at that here in just a moment. He says, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. That was the Holy Spirit brings you life, new life. Verse 7, do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. Now notice this, verse 8, the wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Okay, so notice he gave a, a metaphor there, right? Talking about the wind and, and relating it to the Holy Spirit. And it's interesting because it's the same word. I mean, wind, pneuma, right, in Greek, Spirit, Holy Spirit, and it can mean just regular, our spirit, right? So here he's talking about how the wind, he says, think about the wind. It blows wherever it wishes. So in other words, the Holy Spirit moves in a person's life 
at, based on the sovereignty of God. It's not our choice, right? It's where the Lord wishes, right? It's, oh, that's mine. I'm going to touch, you know. And that's what's amazing, right? When somebody can be ministering the gospel uh, in a crowd or one-on-one, and, you know, this person receives and this person doesn't. Why? Holy Spirit. That's where he decided, right? He's, he, in his sovereignty, that's the person I'm going to choose, right? And he says, and you hear its sound, Okay, you hear it sound. In other words, there's evidence, right? Again, transformation. There's something that shows. I mean, just the fact that you're here tonight on a Wednesday, you know, that's just like, okay, what? Something happened in you, right? That says, I want to hear the word of God. I want to be around the people of God. I love them. Right? And I love God, and I love the Word, and I want to worship Him, and I want to be encouraged and equipped in the, in the faith and built up. It's like, that's the Spirit of God, guys, working in you. Amen. Because normal people, right, we don't want to do that. Okay? When I say normal, I'm talking about unbelievers, right? Why? I want to come, right? Okay, maybe to do some fellowship, but no, it's like we want God, right? We want more of Him. We want to be just in His presence, that's evidence, right, of that, that's the sound, right? And when you first got saved, you know, when the Holy Spirit touched your life, there was a sound, wasn't there? Amen. And that was, that was evidence. Something happened in you. And I, I mentioned a little while ago what happened to me. Just bored out of my mind, and then there I am, all of a sudden it's like, I'm worshiping. Oh, God, you are so good. <laughs> the sound of the Holy Spirit. Right? That's what he does. And guys, you know, Jesus told them, you shouldn't marvel, right, at what I'm saying, but we should marvel at the work of the Spirit, right? That he chose us, first of all, and that he's transformed us, right, and is continuing that process, transformed our, our spirits, and now he's transforming our minds. Amen? And so you see that evidence. There's that sound of the Holy Spirit, okay? And so you don't know where it comes from, where it's going. It's like, no, we can't explain it. It's almost like, what just happened? <laughs> you know, when you came to the Lord, you probably thought, what? and people around you, what happened to this guy? What happened to this lady? They used to be the party, or they used to be the, you know, or whatever you used to do. You know, you don't do that anymore. Now you're over here. It's like you're on a new trajectory, right? It's like, that's the Holy Spirit, right? Glory, yeah, praise God, and we can marvel at that, and thank God for that, right? Thank you, Jesus, that, you, that you're doing that and, and done that in my life. So Nicodemus in verse 9. He said to him, how can these things be? <laughs> so he's still like, what are you talking? I still don't get it, right? Jesus answered him, are you teacher of Israel, and yet you don't understand these things? I mean, that's a good point. I mean, you're supposed to be teaching these things, <laughs> right? And, and you're not, you don't even understand? Verse 11, truly, truly, I say to you, I, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we've seen, but you do not receive our testimony. I have said to you, I've told you earthly things, and you don't believe. Wow, that's scary, right? Like, he's, and you know, and, and just real quick, when, when the Lord speaks to us like that, now, that, that must have hurt him, don't you think? You don't believe, Nicodemus. Like, what are you saying? You know, he probably, I'm here. <laughs> I told you, it's like, you know, I see these things, and I'm clearly you're from God. He says, but you don't believe, right? That's an admonition. You know, and we see that constantly in the word, right? Where you get admonished and you're like, ooh, that correction. But then we constantly also see the grace of God tied in with that admonition. He says, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except, uh, except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. In other words, standing right before you, I was in heaven, right? And he's telling you, I'm just trying to tell you in a way, I'm trying to get you in a way, in an earthly way to understand this. And he goes, and you don't get that. I, I, I want to give you even deeper truths, heavenly, you know, but I can't even do that, okay? He says, so let me tell you this, verse 14, because you know the law, right? And Moses lifted up the servant, and as Moses lifted up the servant in the wilderness, so the Son of Man uh, be lifted up. So must the Son of Man be lifted up, okay? Now, do you guys remember that situation? Okay, there was a situation where, those that don't know, there was a situation where, uh, the, of course, the Israelites continuously rebelled. They were complainers, right? I mean, just right out of the gate, they're free, right? And right away, 
oh, we're going to die. Like, what? I just rescued you. I just got you out of there, right? I did all these, you know, these, these, uh, these things uh, to, to Egypt to get you out, and you don't trust me, right? And then, and then later on, like, oh, we're, 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 there's no water here. Oh, you brought us out here to kill us. And like, what? <laughs> really? <laughs> And then later on, like, oh, man, the food that we had, the meats that we had back in Egypt, oh, they were just so wonderful. And it was like, life was so great. Like, what are you talking about, <laughs> right? And they just constantly, just over and over again, trying the patience of God, testing God, right? And so one of these situations, God, you know, in his wrath, rightfully so, right? God is never wrong in pouring out his wrath. I mean, he could have killed him. And one time he said, Moses, I'm going to start again. Just going to wipe them all out and just with you, we'll just, in other words, start all over. And Moses says, don't do that. God. He interceded, right? And, he, and, he, and God says, God relented from that, right? He didn't have to, but he was gracious. Oh, thank God for his grace. And here you situa- see a situation, though. God was angry and snakes, he just let the snakes come out. All the poisonous snakes that were in the wilderness just gathered there, started biting people, right? But God, being merciful, there he is, the grace. All right, Moses, you know, create this, uh, this little, this rod, this staff, put a, a, a snake on there, right? And uh, lift it up and anyone, tell the crowd, tell, tell the people, anyone who looks on it, they'll be okay. They're not going to die, right? And so he's, Jesus is referring to, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that, who, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Because think about that situation. All they had to do was look. How crazy is that? Like, how is looking at this serpent, right, on this pole, on this staff, how is that going to help me with venom in, in, in my body, right? But God said to do it. In other words, you, you just believe, right? Just trust me. And so that's what Jesus is saying. So in the same way that whoever believes in me, just have eternal life. This sickness, this infection of sin that has permeated your soul, all right? That's affected your emotions, your will, your actions, every part of you. That de- we're depraved, aren't we? Right? Romans 3, 10, no one is good. No one seeks after God. We're just so infected of, with it, right? We have, to, we have to fight thoughts throughout the day, don't we? And, and put them into submission and say, no, I'm not going to think that. But what is that? That's that reciting sin, right, that, that we deal with. But Jesus says, whoever believes in me, Right? Just believe. You'll have eternal life. Wow, what a promise. What? Just believe. For God so loved the world. Now think about that statement. Because Jesus is not just talking about, oh, the, the world, in a sense, like, wow, because the world's so big. When, when, he's not referring to that. He's referring to a couple of things. He's referring to the fact that, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm giving you some insight here, Nicodemus. Because salvation has only been for the Jews and maybe just a few here, you know, Rahab and, you know, just a few that would, you know, believe, right, that came in, that got grafted in. He says, now salvation is going to be for every tribe, tongue, and nation, for the world, right? He's giving them that insight. But he's also telling them something, too, because remember how I just described the Israelites? They were bad, weren't they? I mean, I told you last week, it's like, I mean, God could have chosen just the, the Egyptians that, you know what, I'm going to choose you because... The, the Israelites, they're no better than you, right? It's not like, but he chose the Israelites, and he chose them, and he rescued them. And so we, we see that uh, it's, it's just the grace of God. And so for God so loved the world now, he's like, okay, I loved you, and you've been, you've been people that have turned away. You're just, you're corrupt, right? You're evil, you're sinful. Now I'm, I'm going to love this wicked, sinful world, Right? Again, showing the grace of God. God so loved the world. This, this world that turned its back on him, right? Read Romans 1. It's this world that it just says, no, I'm going to do my own thing, right? That's just the, that's, that's, that's the world that Jesus came to save. A world that was not searching for God, looking for God to say, God, you gave me life. And look at this, this amazing creation that you did. And so I want to seek you out. I want to serve you. And No, we don't do that naturally. Right? That's why, again, that's a, that's, a, that's a miraculous thing that the Lord does by the Holy Spirit. So, for, I mean, so you could even interject there. For God so, so loved this wicked, sinful, prideful, you know, world that turned its back on him. God loved that world. Love you and me, right? That's us. We're, we're that world. 
that he gave his only son that whoever believes, there it is again, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And so you see there that it's a work of the Spirit salvation, right? So when we present the gospel, we under, that should encourage us, not discourage us, right? Encourage us. It's like, okay, God, I'm going to just present. And like Paul said, it, it's not with wise, persuasive words. It's just the simplicity of the gospel, right? We're all sinners. So believe in the Lord Jesus. Trust in him for salvation to wash you clean from your sins, right? Repent. Turn away from that. Put your trust in God. That's all we do. That's the gospel, right? It's simple. Just there it is. And now, okay, Lord. And we pray, right? We're part of it. We pray. And, we, and, and I'm not saying we don't, we don't try to persuade, because even Paul said, I, I, with all my might, I try to persuade. I try to be all things to all people. I'm like, yes, we work at it. But understanding, results are up to God, right? It's in God's hands. Can't do it. So we can't get, we shouldn't get frustrated when it doesn't happen, but just trust. Okay, God, trust you. And I'm just going to believe, Right? I just trust, trust your sovereignty, your goodness. I mean, you saved me. A lot of people don't think I would get saved. And you know, so other, some of you might say that same thing, right? Like, whew, if you look at your background, but God had mercy. God had grace upon you, amen? So for God so loved the world, he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, right? In other words, to be condemned, but have eternal life. Verse 17, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, Right? In other words, the first time, this is why Jesus came. His mission was to bring salvation right? to every tribe, tongue, and nation. That's it, right? To open it up, for the, to open up the gospel. Okay? But notice he says, he didn't come to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Praise God. Aren't you glad? Okay? So, and that word condemn, I mean, that means, right, to, this is it. Right? When, when the judge, uh, you know, somebody's in trial because for murder, whatever, some, and, and there's, there's the, 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 ju- the, the judgment. You, we're, and especially in the old days, they used to say that you have been condemned to die on such and such a day, you know, on the gallows or whatever it was, right? You know, and that's what it, it's, and so in the same way, right, we, can, we look at that and know that we're all condemned because it says in verse 18, whoever believes in him, is, is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already. You know, you've heard the phrase, dead man walking, right? When they're going to their execution, those that have been condemned, right? Just, they say dead man walking, right? In other words, that, that was all of us. We were that dead person walking, right? But we believed. And how do we believe? The Spirit of God touched us, right? He was gracious to us. And so understand that that's, just, that's the condition of all of man. We're we're all condemned unless the grace of God, unless the Spirit of God comes in our lives. He says, and he says he's condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Verse 19, and this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and the people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his work should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Okay, so there's a couple things I want you to see there. He says, again, in verse 19, this is the, light, this is the judgment. The light, who's that? Jesus came into the world, right? And the people love the darkness. Wow. And now, what does that mean? Because it says, it says, rather than the light, because their works were evil. Now, I think we all can understand that, right? Because Jesus, his primary thing is he was preaching the gospel. And he was preaching, I mean, you look at the Beatitudes and all these, and, and he was showing, I mean, look at what he said. He says, I mean, you, you know, you've been taught, and it's true, right, that, you know, it's, you, you shall not murder. One of the Ten Commandments, right? And what do he say? But what about your heart? Do you, do you, do you hate people? He goes, well, then you've committed murder in your heart. In other words, he's, he, was, he was raising up the standard and says, guys, it's not just these outer actions, it's, this, it's your inner heart, right? He was getting to that. And he, well, now you, thou shalt not commit adultery. Okay, yeah, we get that. Oh, I'm, I'm good. I haven't done that. Yeah, but what about your heart? Where's your heart at, right? Have you been lusting after uh, women? Have you been lusting after the opposite sex? Like, okay, okay, that's, you've been lusting, you've been committing adultery in your heart, Right? And so when, when people are here, you can imagine, right, at that time when Jesus is saying some of the things, there were some people that just like, okay, 
<laughs> Not for me, right? Okay, I love that. Oh, you're going to do a miracle? Okay, I'm there, right? Oh, but you're going to preach? Oh, no, no. I'll, I'll come back when you're doing the miracles again, right? People love the, oh, no, I don't want to hear that, right? Even, you know, and, and people, there's people that we've invited, right, sometimes at church, and, and what do we see? We see this in action, don't we? Ooh, I'm going to hear about sin. I'm going to hear about the, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, and they know that. See, the Holy Spirit's already bringing that conviction. They know they're in the wrong, but we love darkness, right? All of us were like that. We were darkness lovers, right? We love, what does that mean? We love sin, we, you know, and, and when it says darkness, it's just referring to the fact is like, we don't want to get near to God, you know, because God is light, and we just want to do our own thing. We want to, we want to stay in that life, right? And again, unless the Spirit of God does something, right, and just interjects into our life, right, just interrupts our life, and whew, and things change. So light is coming to the world. People love the darkness rather than because they, their works were evil, okay? People, for everyone who does wicked things hates the light, verse 20, and does not come to the light lest his works should be exposed. There it is. Oh, wow, you're just, yeah, that's me. <laughs> Guilty. People don't want that, right? Naturally, in the natural, we don't want to hear that. People turn away from that. He says, but notice this, but whoever does what is true comes to the light. So the work of the Spirit in our lives, right? That transformation, the making us born again, right? What would happen? Now we want to do what's true. We want to live right, right? We love righteousness. So what do we do? We come to Christ, right? We come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that the works have been carried out, how? In God, Notice, it's like the pride's gone. It, we're saying like, okay, I want to live for you. I want to glorify you. I want to do these things. I want to, it, but it's you, God, that are doing, that's doing it in me. It's not me, right? I acknowledge that. You, you came, you transformed my life, and now you're using me, right? And so I just want to continue to give glory to God and tell others about the goodness of God, right? And, and we acknowledge that. And again, that's, that's an evidence of that born, being born again. Because now you, you want people to know that it's not you. You want people to know that it's God working in you, right? That in itself tells you you're born again, right? That's evidence. There's that, again, the wind blowing in your life. That's the Holy Spirit, right, being made manifest. Yet you want to give glory to God, right? So you were made righteous by, uh, not by any doing, of your own. So let's look now at 1 Corinthians 6, 9. All right? Because we were made righteous by any doing of our own. Verse, 1 Corinthians 6, 9, it says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Okay? We all understand that, right? You're, you're unrighteous. You're not, you know, you're... And he's going to give a little kind of little list here. He says, Now do not be deceived. This is so important for us today. All right? Because a lot of times... Um, I heard a, a believer one time, and they were trying to, they had a, a bunch of um, homosexual friends, I guess, before they got saved, and they were still kind of talking to them, and, and they were, and she was saying, you know, how, yeah, I know what the word says, but I mean, in other words, she was, she was just like, but are they really going to hell, or, you know, kind of this, you know, trying to, almost to justify it, because, oh, I've heard that some, you know, they have this, you know, something wrong uh, biologically, or something, some going on there, and that's why they're predisposed to this, and so, in other words, it's not their fault, and, and so, you know, kind of, and, but notice this, do not be deceived. Don't be deceived with, you know, when you read stuff like that. Oh, well, this is why, you know, people are this way, and it's because of this, and so, oh, okay, well, no, don't be deceived. Okay? The unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. And remember, that was all of us. We were all unrighteous, right? It says, neither the sexually immoral. And Jesus, remember, he lifted up the standard. Nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers, swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. That's it, you won't get it. Remember Jesus said, you won't see the kingdom of God? Now Paul says, you won't, you won't inherit the kingdom of God. It's not something you have to look forward to. You're not going to get there, right? And verse 11, I love this phrase, and such were some of you, right? 
Some of, some, some, some of you were homeless. So don't tell me that someone can't become born again and they leave the lifestyle of being homosexual. It's right here. In other words, he saw it. Paul saw it. You know, people living the homosexual lifestyle. People that were, uh, you know, uh, revilers, swindlers, cheats, right? You know, just cheating people out of their money. I mean, these Bernie Madoff types or whatever of the day, right? And just like, and he saw the transformation. You were that, now you're this. Right? You were rescued. You are born again. Such were some of you. You know, you were sexually immoral. You were, you know, adulterers. And idol you had all these idols in your house, all that, and all that's just, boom. You're different, right? And I love this, but you were washed. Remember, remember what Jesus said? Unless you're born of the water and the spirit, you were washed. Right? It makes me think of, uh, what is it, Isaiah, right? Though your sins be, be like scarlet, They'll be whiter than snow. Oh, don't you love that? You can't take out this, you know, this scarlet stain you know, out of any garment. You just, you just, no matter what you do, right? He says, but the Holy Spirit can do it. You can't take away sin, right? There's nothing you can do. It's just no matter what, there's still that sin, that sin spot, that it's just, it's that, that venom, right? That's it's just there. Oh, but the Holy Spirit can. He can wash you, right? And, he, and he's washed us. You were washed, you were sanctified. What does that mean? You were set apart. In other words, now you're mine. <laughs> right? You don't belong to the devil anymore. You belong to me. Right? You're on my team now. You're not on his team anymore. You were sanctified. You were justified. You were made holy before, made righteous before God in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. And you see it right there, right? The whole the Trinity. Lord Jesus, the Spirit, Father God. Right? All did this. Praise God. Look at Colossians 2.13. Going back to Colossians. He says, And you who were dead in your trespasses, one of my favorite verses, I feel like this is kind of encapsulates, encapsulates the gospel right here. You were dead in your trespass and the uncircumcision of your flesh. All right? So there we were. We were dead. Right? We were all those things that he just talked about in 1 Corinthians 6. Right? We were the drunkards, revilers, swindlers, thieves, greed, all that. You know, we, we had sin in our hearts. We were dead in our trespasses and the uncircumcision of our flesh. Right? In other words, we were hard before God. God made alive together with him. Who did it? God. Holy Spirit. Right? There's the, there it is, the, the blowing of the Holy Spirit Right? in his sovereignty. Having forgiven us all our trespasses. Woo! Praise God. That's the gospel, right? All of them. In other words, you can be like, ooh, but this one, God. <laughs> you know, sometimes we have to allow the Holy Spirit to remind us, hey, my power, the, the work of Christ on the cross, he covered, that's why Jesus, it is finished, right? I, I, Jesus, I didn't come to abolish, so I came to fulfill the law. I came to live it out, live this perfect life, and so therefore on the cross, right, we can have this substitution, the life you should have lived, I lived. That's why Jesus didn't just come just to come, get on the cross and die. No, he had to live the perfect life as a human. He did it for us. What we couldn't do, he did it. And then on the cross, he took all our sin, every single trespass, right? All the sin, and there it is. He took it in our place. Guys, that's awesome, <laughs> right? This, this, uh, uh, this, uh, um, Double, um, oh, I forgot how R.C. Sproul put it, but, you know, we got this, uh, we got the, he lived our life, and then he also took our sin, right? And so he, he did this double uh, work in our, in our heart. So you were sanctified, you were justified. But in Colossians 2, he says, and you were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcisions of your flesh. God made alive together with him. He did it, right? All of a sudden, whew, life. Having forgiven us all our trespasses, by canceling the record of debt. Okay, what is this record of debt? We're going to stop right here and come back. But Ezekiel 18.4 says, Behold, all souls are mine, the Lord says. The soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. The soul who sins shall die. Right? Why? Because you have this, this record of debt, right? All this sin, these trespasses. Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift, oh, there it is, the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now let's go back to Colossians 2, 14. So by canceling this record of debt, 
right? All this sin, we were supposed to die. That stood against us, right? And in fact, you had the accuser, the devil, reminding God they're guilty. And he was in his right to do that. He was right. We were guilty. We, we were supposed to be condemned, right? That stood against us with all its legal demands, God's justice, right? We broke his commands. He says, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Oh, isn't that awesome? The beauty of Christ. He took it on the cross. He took it all. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Disarmed, there it is. In other words, now the enemy couldn't say anything. Oh, but, but, but. I paid the price, devil. It's done, right? They're justified. They're sanctified. They're washed, you know? And so, and we got to remind ourselves of that. That's, that's truth, guys. That's the gospel truth, right? This is the grace of the God of truth. This is, and so we got to remember that. That's why we got to preach the gospel to ourselves, because sometimes we tend to what? We, we tend to drift away. We tend to you know, start living the way we used to live, right? And that's a daily thing that we have to guard against, but we remind ourselves that that's a spiritual reality, that I am washed, I am sanctified, right? I, 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 I've been made new in Christ. Jesus, he canceled that record of death. That's not who I am anymore. So now this, this salvation needs to come out. I need to, as, as Paul said, I need to work it out, work out my salvation with fear and with trembling. So Jesus lived our life and died our death. What a gift. What a gift. So, so what then is our response to God? And what do we tell others who are lost? Well, let's look at Acts 17.30. He says, The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Now this is, this is what we, we should be preaching. You know, God, God commands all people. We don't say, well, I'm commanding you. No, God commands. He's God. He has that divine right, right? God commands all people everywhere to repent. So, you know, when you're presenting the gospel, that's something you need to share. You know, that God commands us to repent. And what does that mean? To turn away, right? Because we understand it is the Spirit of God. It's only the Spirit of God. He, he chooses by the, you know, Jesus said, no one comes to me unless the Father draws him near. How does he do it? By the Spirit of God. We know that that's the working of the Spirit, but we're still called to call people, right? To tell people of what God is telling them, right? He's calling them to repent. He commands them to repent. Why? Because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world. We got to let people know there's a judgment coming, right? There's a judgment coming. He will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, right, through Christ. And of this he has given us assurance to all by raising him from the dead. That assurance, that resurrection. I mean, because it wasn't enough that Jesus died. If he, just, if he died, we would be at the same place where Adam and Eve were, the very beginning. Okay, they're innocent, not justified. I mean, not, you know, they're, they're, that's it. Okay, but he rose again, now we have newness of life, right? Now we're empowered. Now we have the Holy Spirit, okay? And then, of course, going back to John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. This is something, and, and, and a lot of people do share. That's good, right? We need to go back to the basics when we're sharing. God so loved the world, this wicked world that turned its back on him. He loved it. What, how? That he gave his only son. He gave his very best. He didn't send an angel. An angel couldn't have done it, right? Nobody else could have done it. Only Jesus Christ. That was the only way. And that's why even Jesus, remember at the Garden of Gethsemane, what does he say? What does he say? He says, Lord, if there's any other way, take this cup from me. I mean, Jesus is kind of just like, is, you know, I know where it isn't, but it's like, I don't want him. There's no desire to go to the cross, right? We don't, and see, and, and which is a reminder to us, it's like, it's okay to pray that way. Lord, is this, is this what you call him? This suffering, this is there another way? He's like, no, just trust me, right? Just trust me, I'm working something in you. So he gave his only son. He was the only way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life, right? That whoever believes in him should not perish. So you can tell people, are you a whoever, right? Could it be that God is calling you, that God is drawing you by his spirit to repent, to turn away, right? So that you can have eternal life. And what is eternal life? Acts 17, right? Remember the, the high priestly prayer. What is Jesus saying? This is eternal life, that they would know you 
and, 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 and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. To know him, right? You get to know God. Could it be that God's calling you so that you can know him, right? So you can turn away from your, life's, your life, right? Life of sin, so that now you can live a life of righteousness. Because I don't know about you guys, because when, when I read earlier from 1 Corinthians 6, and you see all these, this list of sins, right? And you think, or at least I think of it, but God, we, we still do some of those things, right? Sometimes, you know, we still lie sometimes. We still, you know, have the wrong attitude. We still have, you know, we, we lose our temper. We, you know, all these things. Because remember, that wasn't just all the sins, right? He was just listing some of them. He, Paul did that several times, right? Through, in, in different books of the Bible where he's talking about, okay, you know, these sins. And, you know, in the last days, Timothy, there's going to be people going to be, you know, like this and lovers of themselves and, you know, boasters and all this and, you know, turning away from their own, you know, children, all that, you know, just, and, and so we still do some of these things sometimes, right? But again, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you, you know, you've been justified. And so we, that's why, that's why I say we need to go back to that, to the gospel and to know, okay, that's not lo- no longer who I am. And so let me walk out the gospel. And so now we have eternal life. Now we get to know God. Guys, that's the ultimate in the gospel, that we get to know God. The fact that you can fellowship with him. You know, when I shared on uh, the Holy Spirit, just, just, and that just hit me so hard because it's just like, we need to be reminded of the fact that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You know, when I was reading that, I was like, it's okay, God, I know that, but I can't fathom that. You were in me? You know? I mean, you know, I mean, you know what I've how I, how I am every day, Lord, and you put up with me? And that's why he's saying, yeah, that's why I'm calling you to change, right? That's why I'm helping you to change. I'm helping you to become sanctified, more like me. I'm like, okay, thank you. Thank you for not giving up on me, right? And thank you, you won't give up on me because I'm yours, right? I've been called out. I'm, uh, it's, uh, I'm the, now the, uh, uh, you reside in me, right? In Acts 3.19, we'll end with this. He says, repent therefore and turn back that your sins may be blotted out. And I love this, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. See what happens when you're born again? Times of refreshing, right? And that's what, you know, when you think about being born again, right? It's this freshness of life. When that baby comes, right, you're just like, ah, life, right? There's just this joy that comes, Right? Wow, this life. And same thing with us, this refreshing, times of refreshing. It's like, I've got new life. You all, you, every, you, the, new perspective, right? Times of refreshing come. And so that's it. And I'm, and I'm sharing this because, again, this is something we can share with others. Repent, turn away, turn back from your sins. God wants to bring you times of refreshing, He wants to give you new life, right? That He may send the Christ appointed for you. Wow, don't you love that? That he may send the Christ appointed for you. Who? Jesus. Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, the sent one. He's appointed for you. If you're a believer, he's been appointed for you. Isn't that awesome? He's been appointed for us, and and we we get Christ by the Holy Spirit, right? He blew upon us. He came upon us. And we, we had no part in that. All we did is now we respond in faith. What do we do? We just believe. We look and say, yes, Jesus, I trust what you did on the cross, right? Just like they, he said, look up, and you know how they looked upon the serpent. So I look to you, your finished work on the cross. And I trust that now I am washed. Now I am sanctified, right? Now I am justified. I'm yours, right? And so we go with that and we share that gospel. We share that gospel truth, the grace of God in truth, you know, because he was gracious to us and he continues to be gracious to us. Amen. And that's, what, that's something also we want to emphasize to others, right? It's like, I'm not perfect. The fact, the fact that I believe in Christ, you know, I do that in a spirit of humility, knowing that I'm not worthy, right? I mean, that's what we, when you think about faith and, and, and trust in Christ, it, it comes in a spirit of humility. It's, it's, a, it's a complete way of saying, God, where God's saying, I've got this. That's why I went back to John 3. Because that, you see that, don't you? It's, it's all God, right? It's, it's, 
I did it. The Holy Spirit does it. All you do is what? Just believe. You just trust. That's it. So that's the encouragement we can give people, right? That we can share. Believe. Believe in the Lord Jesus. Repent. Turn away. Right? God calls us to, he commands us to repent. And see what, see what the Holy Spirit does. You know, share with our coworkers, share with our family members, share with strangers that we meet, right? Share the gospel. And let's pray. Let's ask the Lord to help us to do that. Because unless we're asking him to do that, we're not going to be mindful of that, right? We, we know ourselves. In America, we're so busy, right? We get really busy and we get caught up with things and it's like, then that's the last thing on our minds. So we need to ask the Lord, Lord, give us that mindset. Remind us of how you were so gracious to us. How you just intercepted our lives. You just, boom, you just came in, right? I wasn't looking for you, searching for you. You did, Lord. But somebody was faithful to do that, right? You know, Susie's grandma, she was faithful. Or Susie's mom, she was faithful to share the gospel with my mom. You know? And then later on I found out, oh, well, it was... You know, Susie's dad that kind of started the whole thing from top. And I was like, wow. But they were faithful to do that. You know, her parents had, you know, Bible studies at their house. Why? Again, they were born again. They were trying to, like, how can we be used, right, to share this gospel with other people? And the, right? And, and that's what, you know, she told my mom. She says, are you born again, Lita? Are you born again? I was like, oh, what is that? What does that mean, born again? Well, new life in Christ. No, I'm not. I don't even know what that means. But it, it just made my mom think, and she just she was like, oh, wow. Never heard that in the Catholic Church. Never heard that before. What are you talking about? And th- what was that? The Holy Spirit was then using, right, using that, that encounter, just, okay, I'm drawing you now. It was a new hunger put in her, and just drawing her near, right? Drawing her near. And so let's ask the Lord. So many people are in need, and a lot of times, see, because for my mom, why did she go? She heard about, oh, that they pray for the sick. My mom was sick at the time. And she came because of that. Again, not searching for God. Searching what he could do for her, right? That's, that's the state of sinful man. We just, oh, what can you do for me? Oh, you can heal me? Oh, okay, yes, I need healing. <laughs> right? Oh, you can restore marriage? Oh, okay, I need that, right? But let's, let's, let's see, use those things. God would, that's what Jesus did, right? In revealing, you know, his goodness, his power, his grace. He said, okay, I got your attention now. Let me preach the gospel to you. Repent, guys, right? And, he's, and I, I am the way, the truth, and the life, right? He revealed himself to them. And so let's ask the Lord that he would do that within us, right? That he would use us, you know, because um, he, that's his desire. That's his desire. And uh, just like, you know, we were called to him, there's others out there he's calling to himself. And so let's ask the Lord, help us, Lord. Remember what Jesus said? He said to the disciples, guys, op- open your eyes. The fields, are, they're white for harvest. Open your eyes. And so let's ask the Lord, Lord, open our eyes. You know? That opportunity that right there at work, oh, there it is, God. Use me. Use me. So let's pray. Father, I just pray, Lord, that you would you do a work, Lord. In, you've already done a marvelous work. <laughs> Thank you, first off. Thank you for changing us, for transforming us, for giving us new life. And Lord, we pray, Lord, that we don't, we don't want to be stagnant, Lord. We don't want to be caught up in the busyness of, of American life, which we're so guilty of, if we're honest. We're, we're guilty of that every day. But help us, Lord, to be mindful of the gospel, be mindful of living the, uh, for your kingdom, to seek first your kingdom, Lord, and all your righteousness. And so help us, Lord, to, to see you at work, where you're working, where you're drawing people, where they're hurting and you're using those hurts to show your kindness. Lord, so help us to be bold in in witnessing. It's amazing, Lord, to think as as you uh, spoke to the disciples, you said you told them to pray earnestly that the Lord would send laborers into the harvest field. Lord, help us to be mindful, to send laborers and also to know we are laborers, to be laborers or to be workers it does take work so help us to do that but lord we know it's by your spirit lord that you make that work effective that you bring fruit and so lord i pray that you would prepare us lord those those divine appointments those times throughout the day uh, to be mindful help us to be mindful lord 
and to be bold. Give us boldness and fill us with your spirit, Lord, because we know that's, that's, where, that's where it really happens when we're filled with your spirit. And so we know that means we gotta get in the word so we can be full of the spirit of God. Help us to get in the word so that word is just oozing out of us. It's just like Jeremiah says, just shut in our bones that it just wants to burst forth. And so thank you, Lord, for doing that work in us so that we can be a part of doing the work in others in Jesus' name. And so I ask that you bless your people as we go. Bless every family represented, uh, every man, every woman here, Lord, every child. Lord, thank you for your anointing on their lives. Thank you for your protection from the enemy, Lord, for keeping us in the faith, Lord. And uh, thank you for meeting all of our needs. In Jesus' name, amen, amen.